So we'll get started with our talk. So we're going to tag team you today. So Dr. Lance is going to go first. Dr. Jerry Lance is the Division Chief of Adolescent Medicine. As I stated, she's uh, uh, internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, she's been with us for many years and uh, run the teen clinic and uh, uh, the medical director for the teen clinic. Uh, she's also nationally known in the uh, NASPAG GYN, uh, adolescent GYN uh, circles. Uh, and so we're going to uh, give you a day in the life at the teen clinic. So we pulled up the schedule and we saw what kind of patients were coming into the teen clinic and what kind of concerns they had. And so we're going to give you kind of the, the top five things that, uh, that we see in the teen clinic, kind of a day in the life. All right. So good morning, everybody. This, I hear, is the last Peace Grand Rounds for the month of December and for 2018. So we'll try not to disappoint you. <laughs> All right, Alan, I have no financial disclosures. We do want to apologize in advance. There may be some things that we may say that may make you feel uncomfortable. Does anybody in this room besides Dr. Blackwood have teenagers in their home? Okay. Does anybody know a teenager? Okay, great. Does anybody have anybody in their house who might be a teenager in the next five years or so? Okay, great. All right, so we are not talking about any of your kids, okay? We might be talking about kids that your kids might know, but I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that we are singling out their child. All right, so here's some of the um, cool people that we get to work with. So Dana Abney and Erin Hokanson and Suzanne Barron are our three fabulous nurse practitioners that man the forts at the three clean, um, teen clinic sites when we can't physically be in the building, and we couldn't do this, this game without them. Um, this is William Fleming High School. This is Patrick Henry High School. Both of these high schools here in town actually got us out of the trailers in, that we were in in the, back, <laughs> in the back parking lot and built us clinics in the schools when they built new buildings in the last um, 10 years. So that's been a great thing for us. This is, our, this is an old picture of our central 902 site. Notice that the college was still there. This is what's actually on our website, so I'm sorry we're getting this updated. But this is where we still are year round. Um, Brooke Michael is our teen educator that runs around the Roanoke Valley. She educates um, teenagers and parents and teachers and all kinds of community groups about what's going on in the world of teenagers. And so um, she's our woman behind the scenes who is um, out there um, in the community at all times. This is Victoria Rosenberg. She is our uh, mental health support person over at the Teen Health Center. She is um, helping us uh, a great deal. She just started with us this year, and so we're happy to have her on board at the schools and at the central site. And a big shout out to Felicity Adams and the adolescent um, site gang who comes over and helps us with some of our um, kids who need um, a little additional psychiatric help. All right, so here's our objectives. We're gonna, um, so as Dr. Blackwood said, we um, kind of poured over the, the charts from the last year and came up with a top five list of things we end up talking about over and over again. So even when kids come in for a sports physical or a well visit, when we look at their intake form where they check off things they're worried about, there seems to be some things that kind of hit as like kind of a broken record. Um, so we'll talk about those top five reasons that we end up kind of talking and talking and talking in the, in the teen clinic about similar stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit about the local behavior trends of teenagers in the Roanoke Valley, and we'll hopefully provide you guys with some practical tools to help intervene in some common um, problems that are being faced by our adolescents. So here's some of the top five challenges for our adolescents in our community. One is they're not sleeping, so insomnia. We see lots and lots of anxiety and depression. Um, and media use, misuse in teenagers and young adults. Nutrition problems are running rampant. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the substance and vaping use that um, seems to be prevalent in um, our Roanoke Valley. And then the uh, never-ending contraception, sexuality questions and issues that we talk about on a daily basis. Okay, so here are some sleepers and non-sleepers. Um, so this gal over here is kind of typical of a lot of our teenagers, hanging out on the phone, checking that Instagram in the middle of the night, you know, checking to see what her friends are doing when she's not sleeping. 
this young guy over here actually um, looks like he might be getting some good sleep. And interestingly enough, there was just a study that came out that said people get better REM sleep if they sleep by their pet, particularly their dog. So this guy might be ahead of the game. So. All right, some of you guys who have been post-call may know the, these feelings of what happens when you get insufficient sleep. And these are some things that parents will sometimes bring their kids in because they're um, having these symptoms. So they might be distractible, poor attention span, poor organizational skills, poor motivation, irritable, easily frustrated, depression, anxiety, defiance. Any of you who um, know some teenagers might know that these are common things perhaps that uh, that folks um, come in with complaints about, and they can all come from insufficient sleep. This is an older study from 2008, but it's a, it was a um, study of 882 teenagers done by Dr. Danner at the University of Kentucky, and just kind of shows that there's a linear relationship between the number of hours of sleep and what happens with your GPA. These were already pretty highly functioning teenagers he studied, but their GPAs even went up higher when they actually got a little rest. Okay, so normal sleep for teenagers is, is, most of you guys got this right on Kahoot, so should be about nine hours on average. We all know that those, um, those teenagers who um, on Saturday and Sunday are sleeping for 14 and 16 hours, and, um, and so sometimes that averages it out between the week and the weekend. Um, 15 to 20 percent of your sleep should be REM sleep, um, and that's the important time when you're, um, because your prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's developing in middle and late adolescence, that's when they, re they really need that REM sleep so that it can actually fully develop that prefrontal cortex. And that's when the repair cells and immune functions are occurring with deep and REM sleep. So some practical sleep strategies that we end up talking about over and over again is regulate your sleep time. Try to actually get to bed on time, um, if it, especially on the school nights, and, and try to set yourself with a sleep goal. Um, eliminate screens. Most teenagers truly do not need to have a television in their bedroom. It's a hard reality, but um, because parents often feel like if they take it out of their teenager's room, they probably have to take it out of their own room too, and they don't want to cross that line. But so, so the earlier we could talk up to um, parents of preteens about maybe eliminating the screens in in the sleep space, the better success perhaps they'll have when they're in high school. Um, and and really, there probably is not a screen emergency that the average 16-year-old really needs to be looking at their phone at night about. So not a bad idea as you're counseling parents to ask them to just leave the, all the phones should be left in the kitchen or in another room before they go to bed so that they don't get in the habit of checking their phone. Now those of us who are on call and have an iPhone, perhaps it does need to be close to the bed. but. For the average 16, 17 year old, they're not necessarily getting called in on an emergency. Um, so chances of the stuff that they're doing on their screens may not necessarily be terribly helpful. Um, make sure the blue light blockers are on your screens. If you guys have an iPhone um, and you don't have this done, go to the display settings and turn on your night shift. And then um, if you set that, that blue light blocker to go on at like five, six o'clock, you aren't getting um, unconscious signals to your brain telling you to be awake. There's a way to do it on Android too, and then there's this Lux system um, that you can download the Lux app and it'll just change your phone over, block the blue light when the sun goes down and your brain actually recognizes that you've done that. Um, you can do that on phones, you can do it on computers, you can do it on TVs. A um, couple other quick tips that we give teenagers is maximize the morning. Dance in your room while you're getting dressed. Find some way to exercise for 10 minutes. If you do it in the morning and you try to get some sunlight on your skin, you actually sleep better at night. So whatever, whatever kind of exercise you can do in the morning is a really great thing to actually help you get your circadian rhythm in, in, in check and then you sleep. And then increase your nutrition and decrease your sugar and caffeine. So add a little bit more vitamin D, add your magnesium, your B vitamins, we'll talk about that in a second, decrease your sugar. And so many of our kids are drinking like a huge cup of coffee in the morning now, you would not believe. So, so trying to, or they're doing an energy drink on their way to school. So at least we try to tell them to please, you know, maybe limit your caffeine after noon. Okay. Um, so this is a busy slide, but it just, I just wanted to point out that there are lots of interesting things that happen in making melatonin. And you need some interesting nutrients. You need some B vitamins, some zinc. You need some magnesium. And all of that has to have a healthy gut and some stomach acid to process this stuff. So remember that whole gut brain thing um, that's going on. And you, know, you will only absorb um, 
nutrients in, in as healthy a gut as you have. But adding a little simple micronutrients, including magnesium and vitamin D, can help you actually make your melatonin, which is um, our end product down here. Okay, so um, the magnesium need for teenagers is 300 to 400 milligrams a day. Um, most, so common food sources of magnesium are not things that kids are necessarily out there eating. So almonds, leafy greens, spinach, kale, that kind of stuff. Not many kids are having cups and cups of green leafies, unfortunately, a day. So just about all of the U.S. population, mm -hmm. unless you're eating dirty vegetables from good soil, um, is a little bit on the magnesium deficient side. And you need that in order to make your melatonin. So it's one of the first things that we um, ask people to, to try to increase a little bit when they're having insomnia issues. So orally you can supplement, but remember that things like milk of magnesia actually promote bowel motility. So sometimes you have a little rate limiting in giving oral magnesium supplements because um, folks can get a little loose stool. But the skin works amazingly well. So even just a little um, Epsom salts or, or um, magnesium chloride salts in a bath twice a week can actually increase your, your total body magnesium a bit, and it works pretty nicely. You can even get magnesium in gels and sprays, and you can rub it on the skin. It works great. Um, and then, again, most of, well, most of the Roanoke Valley does not get enough sunlight anyway, even if you work outside around here. And so um, as kids that have early um, school days and are not out in the sun as much, we find lots and lots of kids that are pretty deficient in vitamin D. And if you don't have enough vitamin D, um, your circadian rhythm is off and you aren't able to make enough um, melatonin. Okay, switching gears. You guys know what this is. Okay. <laughs> that one's pretty obvious because it says it on there. Instagram. In Tinder. Grinder. two dating sites that uh, are prevalent in the Roanoke Valley and then Twitter. Okay, so these are just some of the examples of things that our kids are on all the time. So um, our teenagers in 2018 are exposed. You know, they have lots of media opportunities. Texting is a little old for them, but they will still text, particularly to their parents, right? But um, <laughs> they might text their parent, and they might, they might check Facebook just to see what the old people are doing, right? <laughs> but they don't really put a lot of stuff on Facebook because it doesn't feel very safe to them because it feels like it can last. Um, whereas some of the other forums like Snapchat, and Instagram, and Twitter seem a little bit more temporary and they feel like it's going to um, go away a little bit. Then they're gaming. They're gaming with people all around the world, right? You don't know who they're gaming with. And so, <laughs> so they have all kinds of fascinating exposures. They're on dating sites. And then there's a whole, you know, fascinating media porn area that um, would take a whole other hour talk to go into. But they are on them. So um, there's actually now a recognized media misuse disorder. There's even a few treatment programs in the country to go through media misuse. Um, so on average, teens and young adults look at their phones six to 25 times an hour when you're awake. So I challenge you guys to think about how many times you look at your phone in an hour and see um, where you're at with that. But just keep that in mind. When the old day of pagers, we weren't really looking at our pager that often, right? Because it either, when it went off, you groaned, but you weren't like looking for other stuff. Um, and so it becomes a problem if it begins to interfere with sleep or activities of daily living, then, then you start to get into that um, media misuse disorder. So there's lots of things. Um, we're starting to see some more wrist, hand, finger issues, especially the gamers, and then lots of psychological um, issues with, with um, media misuse. OCD-like tendencies, you know, like checking your phone like 50 times an hour. Um, there's even an interesting subset of Wikipedia um, <laughs> Wikipedia um, misuse where some kids are like looking stuff up. They're like so, you know, worried that they don't know a word or something. So I guess in a way there could be worse things than Wikipedia obsession, but just know that they, I mean, it, it can go into an educational format. So then there's all kinds of stalking and cyberbullying going on these days. We get lots and lots of kids who have had um, a victim, you know, been a victim of social media bullying and, um, you know, pictures that get put up and things like that. So it gets to be something we end up talking about a lot. It all adds to insomnia, it adds to increased anxiety. And then as I said, media porn is a whole other issue. Not all media is bad. So there's lots of great apps for teenagers that we use all the time and we encourage them to use. So the period trackers and pill trackers are invaluable. Those are fabulous. 
So, um, you know, when you're putting somebody on oral contraceptive pills especially, there's ways to track your depot shots and stuff like that as well. But they can be super helpful for kids so that they know if they've taken a pill, what to do if they miss one, all that stuff is great. There's depression apps. This is one called Let's Talk over here on the right. That's one put out, um, it comes actually from the state of Colorado, but it's where um, teenagers who ha suffer from depression can actually network with some um, counselors and they can get local resources of, of people to talk to. Um, the call map is one of my favorites. If you guys don't have this on, on your phone, I would encourage you to do that because it'll tell you a bedtime story. It'll give you some happy music. It'll walk you through a little meditation. It's great for docs. So if you need a moment, um, uh, and it's great for teenagers. And, you know, so if you need a moment of mindfulness, you can pop up that call map. You can put in your earbuds. And you can just slip away for a second and regroup. It's a great thing. Um, and there are other meditation apps out there um, as well, Headspace. I've got a few others coming up. And I want to put in a plug for um, a really great website that comes from the Society for Adolescent Medicine. It's updated. It has current information. It's easy access. Um, when you look for it, you have to put in Thrive and SAM or Society for Adolescent Medicine. Otherwise, you get a bunch of other interesting apps that have nothing to do with adolescent mm -hmm. medicine. But, um, but the Thrive app has um, uh, conversation starters for parents on tricky, um, you know, subjects. It has um, all you need to know about teenage immunizations, where, you know, what you need to do before you head to college. Um, it's got tons of great resources on STDs and um, sexuality kind of stuff. And so it's a super great app to give our parents, um, you know, and our teenagers, and especially in the kids who are heading off um, to college, it's really helpful. So this um, is a reminder to me of what I had a Patrick Henry student last year who told me he just feels like Gollum. So I thought, okay, I have to kind of look back and see what is it about Gollum. I have to, so I pulled up his picture and I thought, oh my gosh, okay, yeah. So Gollum, so this guy, you know, kind of sad, kind of lonely. You know, he's living underground, not getting much vitamin D. <laughs> don't know about his trace mineral. Don't know about his intake at all. He's a little thin. And, um, you know, he's being chased around by this hobbit-like dude, you know, a little paranoid. So, you know, this is what this kid felt like, like Gollum. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you, you are anxious. Gollum. All right. So anxiety and depression is a, a growing issue in young adults. 29% of teenagers nationally report depression. But in our area, 39% of our Roanoke City high school students reported depression in, in, um, in the last year, or something they think about every day. And 26% of our middle school students in Roanoke City reported problems with depression. So it's, it's multifactorial. There's lots of overlapping stresses. Um, I don't know, when I was in high school, I was not so worried about massive school shootings. When I worked in the high schools in Detroit, I was worried a little bit about shootings, but it was usually from kids were worried about shootings from people they knew or getting, their friends getting shot. It was usually after school or drive-by shootings. It was not necessarily in the school. Our kids are kind of worried that they don't know if that, you know, depressed kid in their class is, you know, going to come someday and, and retaliate. So, you know, they're worried. They, you know, and the more they watch the news, the more worried they get. Um, they already have worries. Their bodies are kind of, you know, doing goofy things. Their brains are changing. They have all kinds of exposure to social media. They're exposed to all kinds of adults who take a pill for everything or, or who smoke things for everything. So, so we're in a, we have a pill culture and a self-medication culture that they're seeing. Um, they aren't sleeping and they have rotten nutrition. Um, so suicidal ideation is something we talk about a lot. 15 to 20 percent of teenagers um, locally have reported having a plan to commit suicide in the last 12 months. And the same number have had what they, have con they think is a suicide attempt. Doesn't mean, you know, that um, they told anybody, because um, only 10 percent reported talking to a health care provider about, feel about those feelings. So what do you do? First of all, you have to ask the question. So on all of our routine adolescent uh, well checks and stuff, we give them a PHQ-9. And, um, and it's a great tool for them to fill out in private, kind of um, tips us off where they have problems, if they're feeling a little bit more anxious, if they're feeling a little more depressed, or if you know, they're way over the edge where they're really feeling like they want to harm themselves. So the PHQ-9 is a great tool. The um, GAD anxiety tool is also really great. It's just a seven-question anxiety questionnaire. And we have kids fill that out um, where we're not in the room, and it, um, they are able to give us um, a little more insight into their world. Um, so other things you can do, give them the crisis line. You know, 
we write down connect all the time, 9818181. (laughs) Sorry, connect if you're on the phone. (laughs) But but we do. And then anybody who's heading out of town, going out to college, we try to have our teenagers heading off to college put in this number on the phone, the 1-800-SUICIDE number. Sometimes you're, um, as a college student, you're giving um, uh, advice to a friend to a roommate, and you might save somebody's life. They can get you um, networked in with a local um, therapist or or local resources to help you. Um, And so cognitive behavioral therapy is our first line, which enter Victoria and enter um, Dr. Adams and the gang. So um, that's your first line of treatment. You have to address the underlying things, though. The insomnia and improved REM sleep can sometimes fix the problem if you can get them sleeping. Um, Again, some people treat anxiety and depression with exercise. Probably why we have so many people running marathons, right? I think I always wonder if they're all just have a little anxiety and depression. (laughs) And and then... um, you know, improve their nutrition and then medications, obviously, if you, if, if you need them. Um, so another uh, plug for the meditation and, and sleep apps. There's lots of great sleep apps and meditation. I really like this site. It's put, um, was done by the um, UCSD folks. Um, it's called the Free Mindfulness Project. These are all free. Um, so it's www.freemindfulness.org. And if you go into this thing and you go to free resources, there's this whole host of things, of little MP3 downloads. You can put them on your phone. So I tell teenagers to put this in your little iTunes library, you know, and nobody needs to know, but you might be doing a four-minute body scan. Right? You can just be, they think you're listening to a little hip-hop, and instead you're doing a little mindfulness. So, again, great tool for docs, great tool for um, you know, anybody in healthcare and, um, and super great for, for our teenagers. So that's a great site. Okay, a couple quick words about um, nutrition. 32% of our teenagers in the U.S. are overweight. 29% of our local teenagers have not had a meal with their family in the last seven days. So that's a third. One in three have not sat down at the table with their family. 14% of our local teenagers have not had a fruit or vegetable in the last seven days. But they may have had the number one fruit eaten in the U.S., which is tomato in the form of ketchup. (laughs) And they may have dabbled in the number one vegetable consumed in the U.S., which is the potato in the form of the French fry. I'm sad. Okay. And they're having too much sugar. So on average, our bodies need about six teaspoons of sugar a day. So in water, you don't get any. This is in eight ounces. Orange juice is right up there. Glass of Pepsi and orange juice, pretty similar. Sunny D, pretty similar. They think they're doing something healthy. Um, Kool-Aid actually looks pretty good on that list, right? But <laughs> not so much. So if you stop and get your Starbucks Grande Unicorn Frappuccino, you can get almost as much as your energy drink with 15 teaspoons or 17 teaspoons of sugar. So. And these are not really food. So um, I love some Fruit Loops, but we'll talk about Fruit Loops here in a minute. And Frankenberry, it's so disappointing, right? The captain was not really out there for our health. So we are overfed in terms of calories, undernourished in terms of nutrients. And so these are the things our teenagers are often deficient in. They're not getting enough omega-3s. Um, Their omega-6s are plentiful. Everything that's deep fat fried and stuff, they're getting tons of that stuff. Anything that's processed, they're getting lots of inflammatory omega-6s, but not so much omega-3s. Their vitamin D, calcium is low. Their antioxidants are low. Their magnesium is low, and they don't get enough fiber. So things we talk about with nutrition is we try to talk about foods and not nutrients. Um, Foods you can eat. Emphasize the stuff you can do. You can sleep, you can exercise, try to eat two vegetables a day. So fascinating to kind of identify from them what they think is a vegetable. You'll get fascinating answers. And uh, because I guarantee you, most of them are not thinking about broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, kale. They're not thinking about that stuff. But um, try to eliminate sugar-containing beverages. If you just add, you know, if you do one thing, stop your sodas and, and drink your water. You know, start with, give them one or two things to do that's a positive thing, and chances are they'll latch onto it. And then improve their nutritional value of snacks. Don't eat anything out of a bag or box. Measure a portion, sit down when you're having a snack, and try to make it something that's going to give you something back, like some nuts or some string cheese instead of the cereals, breads, chips. If they eat a fruit, eat the whole fruit. Get the fiber with it. Okay, so just if we teach teenagers how to read labels, they can take over their whole pantry. So if, 
um, shopping with a teenager who is a label reader is an entirely different experience for a, um, for a parent. So I've had some parents come back and go, oh my gosh, we had to come back and throw out everything in our cupboard, which you know, in some ways was really good. So look at the poor sad Fruit Loop, right? So I tell them really, don't look at the rest of the label, just pull up this. So the first ingredient, which of course is the most thing in, that, um, in a serving, is sugar, followed by corn flour blend, and then a whole bunch of other stuff that some of it we don't know, right? Turmeric extract color, yellow six, blue one, BHT for freshness, don't know what that is. Um, but really glad that they, they fortified it with some vitamins and minerals there at the end, okay? Four Fruit Loops. Toucan Sam was such a great friend. And then if, if you go, you think you're doing a great thing, go into the freezer section, right? So I just challenge you to take a peek at the difference between this ingredient list and this ingredient list. This one over here, in case you can't see it, says organic broccoli. Isn't that fascinating? So this is the broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, and cheese sauce, and it has all kinds of interesting things. Now, I am happy to say that the biggest ingredients are broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, and water. And then we get into a whole bunch of other stuff when none of us have enough xanthan gum, apparently. And there's, you know, all kinds of colors and medium chain cherry glass, right? So anyway, so just if you just teach a teenager to be picky about the ingredients, if you can't pronounce something, don't eat it. Um, avoid the partially hydrogenated oils, artificial flavors, sweeteners. High, avoid the high um, fructose corn syrup. They don't have to look at the rest of the nutrition labels. They just look at the ingredient list. If it's, if it's huge, probably shouldn't go in yet. Um, and this last slide is this poor chicken who's going to remind us that perhaps in this country we are over chickened. So Americans consume 10 million chickens an hour. And you are only getting the nutritional benefits that your chicken consumed. So at that rate of production, good chance that the chickens that were in chicken nuggets maybe weren't eating organic, healthy foods to begin with, just saying. So, um, so just, just a thought. The chickens would like us to remember that perhaps we don't need 10 million an hour in this country. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to one of the smartest guys I know, Dr. Blackwood. So Alan has been here for 20 years now, right? So Al has been a pediatric and internal medicine faculty member here 20 years, he's going to tell you a little bit more about the um, origins of how the teen clinics got started here in Roanoke, uh, because he was one of the guys on the move. All right, let's see if I can, there we go. Yeah, we'll go and do this first. All right, so, okay. All right, great. All right, me again. So uh, we're continuing with our day in the teen clinic, uh, and here we are to the uh, substance vaping use and uh, uh, contraception sexuality part of the schedule, uh, also known as our sex and drugs and rock and roll uh, part of the schedule, uh, made famous, the song made famous by Ian Dury and the Blockheads. It's appropriate. Dr. Lance, he did not get nine hours of sleep last night. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So vaping has taken over, right? It's become very prevalent, um, and especially Juul. Does everyone know Juul? Does anyone not know Juul? Let's talk about Juul. Okay, so Brooks Michael, hopefully is listening in, uh, did a great lunch and learn. It's on the, uh, the Krillian YouTube uh, back in May, I believe, and she is our uh, educator extraordinaire. She kind of goes through all of the stuff about Juul. I'll hit the highlights here. Uh, but basically, uh, e-cigarettes, vaping, uh, you, you've got a device, uh, an atomizer, you've got a cartridge of, of uh, liquid and um, chemicals, you've got a battery charger, you've got a mouthpiece, and, and Juul has become the hottest thing among young adults and teens, and we'll talk about that. So what's in the liquid, what's in the vape? Well, there's water, there's chemicals, uh, there's lots of nicotine, okay? So in Juul, there's 40 milligrams in one of those little pods, a Juul pod of nicotine. Uh, and what does that equal? It equals one pack of cigarettes. So in that one little uh, vial or that one little pod, there's 40 milligrams of nicotine. And then they put a flavor in there, and they put in a pleasant sounding flavor or cool flavor like dragon or waterfall, watermelon and gummy bear. Okay, there's no ashtray flavor, all right? So, uh, you know, kids are attracted to this, and so they taste good. They taste like fruit, 
and it's become a big hit with teens, and they think it's just flavoring. I'm just vaping flavoring, and it tastes good, and I like it. They have no idea what's in the pods. They have no idea that there's nicotine in there, and that amount of nicotine in just a few days is highly addictive, highly habit-forming, and so these kids get uh, addicted to it and, and habituated to it very quickly. All right, so this is the Juul website. You can go online and get your starter kit. Uh, you can get the, 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 the device. Uh, you can get some pods. You can get the charger. And again, these are little uh, small attractive things. I'll show you some more pictures in a minute. You charge them on, with a USB port. You can charge them on your computer. Uh, and so this has become a very popular thing. And again, if you order, order the starter kit, you get Virginia tobacco, okay? You don't get uh, Rocky Mount smoker's breath, all right? You get this nice uh, Virginia tobacco and mint and cream and mango. All right, so Juul has become cool. Uh, and so uh, uh, the kids have, 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 adap have adapted to this. And, uh, and so uh, when I was preparing for this, I found it very fascinating, the whole business side of things. So I, you know, I was watching interviews and reading interviews with the founders, uh, listening to the business and the marketing behind it. And so these guys just kind of started this back in 2015, so just a few years ago. And in just a few short years, they've become this huge, this huge company. So, uh, so you know, traditional tobacco back in the 50s and 60s was probably one of the best marketing campaigns ever, right? And so a lot of uh, adults back then started smoking because the, the, the marketing was excellent, and that was back during Mad Men and the heyday of marketing. Uh, and so you know, tr traditional tobacco markets traditionally. Uh, but what Juul did is they marketed via social media. So they hit the Twitter, they hit the Facebook, and they had all of these uh, posts on there. Uh, and, of course, that's where teens are. And so they started seeing this, and it just became viral, as social media does. And so social media in just a few years uh, helped explode the sales. So Juul started out with 20 people, $2 million, and in just a few years, they're a $15 billion company this year. That's how much their sales are. And they have a 75% market share uh, in the vaping world. And so that's just, a, to me, is a fascinating uh, business story and a marketing campaign uh, that they've gone through. So again, they, they have this uh, sleep device. It looks cool. Uh, you, it's, uh, you can put it in your pocket. It's, uh, it's easy to conceal. You can hook it up to your laptop to charge it. Uh, they've got these models that are young. They look successful. They're attractive, uh, and, they're, and they're jeweling. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the teens wanted to be like models. So, uh, and this is just last week, the survey from the National Institute on Drug Abuse came out. And so every year they survey uh, over 50,000 kids across the, the country, and they saw uh, year over year, so last year about 11% of kids said uh, that they were doing e-cigarettes or vaping, and this year it doubled to over 20%. And so it was like, oh my goodness, uh, the, it's just really taking off. Uh, so, uh, again, students take the jewel to school, uh, and again, it's easy to conceal. So they've got them in their, in their pockets, in their backpacks, um, and uh, they, can, they can jewel uh, almost anywhere. They'll do it in the class, so they can just blow the smoke into their coat uh, and, and, and do it uh, very uh, discreetly. Uh, but they, all, they go to the bathroom and do it, and so that's what, uh, that's what it's happened is, as kids have gone and, and they're vaping in the bathroom because it's easy to do, it's easy to take in there. They don't have this big bulky device that goes in there. So to the point where... Uh, the, the kid says, why are there toilets in the jewel room? <laughs> I thought that was a great picture from Brooks. All right, so what about our kids? What are they doing? So they mirror the, the national kids. So uh, when we, we have a youth risk behavior survey that we put out every other year, uh, and it goes to our middle schools and our high schools, and Jerry kind of uh, referenced some of the, the data from that, and so I've got some of the data. And so, uh, again, Dana uh, and uh, Brooks uh, for the November PEDS conference did a whole talk on all of the YRBS uh, uh, results from our area. So if you want that talk, we can get that to you. But they've got all the, the stuff in there. It was a great, excellent talk that was done at the November PEDS conference. Uh, so, but on our surveys, uh, our teens, about 20% of our teens say, yeah, I, I've vaped or used e-cigarettes in the past month. And that's felt to be an indication that they're doing it pretty regularly. Uh, but if you ask them, have you ever vaped uh, before, about 40% of them say, yeah, I've done that. I've at least tried it. I've experimented with it. All right, so anything that, that's pop, that, that becomes that popular, that fast, that successful is going to get the eyes of the government, right? So, um, uh, you know, just, just this past week now the Surgeon General says, you know, I'm going to go after this jewel thing. I'm going to start going after vaping, uh, start making it more um, uh, looking into it. And the FDA is starting to come down on jewel as well. And so they're increasing regulation. They're going to start restricting sales uh, because 
uh, they realized that uh, you know, Juul intended to market this to, to adults, uh, but the kids picked it up, and so the FDA is coming after them now. So, but Juul, uh, for their part, is kind of voluntarily making some changes. So, uh, again, uh, you know, they, they're, they've pulled off their Twitter, they've pulled off their Facebook stuff, uh, and they're going back and they're getting rid of all the models, and they're doing uh, testimonials from people who were smoking cigarettes and are now not smoking cigarettes and they're doing Juul. And so that's really the, the focus of Juul is they're saying, you know, we don't want you to use Juul, we want you to quit smoking cigarettes because we think it's more healthy. And so, so they've kind of changed marketing. They pulled off their uh, stuff out of the convenience stores, so uh, you'll have to get their, their flavored stuff online and you can't get them in the convenience stores anymore. So again, we'll see if this makes a change. This is all just kind of the new stuff that's happened here recently uh, with, with, uh, with Juul. All right, so um, is vaping bad for you? It kind of seems like it ought to be, right? I mean, uh, you know, you're getting all this nicotine in your body that's, that's very addictive and very habit-forming. Uh, that doesn't seem good. You know, nicotine has, is, has vascular effects. It affects your brain. So, you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's good. Um, and, you know, you're not inhaling the bad chemicals that you get when you burn tobacco, right? But you're inhaling stuff, and so it's going into your lungs, and so that doesn't seem like that's going to be good for your lungs. So sure enough, we do see kind of chronic coughs and asthma exacerbations, nosebleeds, and kind of upper respiratory things in people who, who, who vape and jewel. Uh, there's a fear that it may be a gateway kind of a thing. So if you start jeweling, then uh, next month you're going to be smoking cigarettes. And so uh, it's not really panned out to be that way because, again, kids don't think cigarettes are cool. They're dirty and smelly, uh, but jewel is cool, all right? So... Uh, it's not really turned out to be a gateway that we've thought about. And, and there may be other health benefits that are that we don't health, – health harms that we don't know about because it's just so new and, and kids are just starting to use it, and so we just, we just don't know uh, some, of the, some of the things. All right, so what do we do? All right, become aware, right, so you've got to know about it. And, uh, and then we're increasing awareness. We're doing talks. And, uh, and again, you can go look at Brooks, uh, Brooks' talk on the Internet as well. Uh, ask the kids, right? So again, on our surveys and when we're, we're talking with them, we don't just do the do you smoke and do you do dip. Uh, we also talk about uh, Juul and, and are you vaping. We advocate, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, and educate our parents. And so I'm talking with my daughter the other day about you know, do her friends or do she, does she see Juuling in school? And my wife's like, what are you talking about? And so I had to give my wife a Juul lecture the other night. So. <laughs> Uh, so, and again, you know, uh, let the parents be aware. So if your kid smells like mango all the time, they're probably not hanging out at, uh, you know, Whole Foods and, uh, and the mango aisle. Uh, if they've got a lot of nosebleeds, uh, something may be going on. Uh, or if you see these strange battery chargers laying around, that's not your iPhone charger. What kind of charger is that? Uh, so this is another great picture from Brooks. So your, mom, your dad texts, what's this? Oh, it's my flash drive for my English project on PowerPoint. Oh, okay, son, keep up the good grades. Ready to go. All right, so um, uh, we're all familiar with the United Way, uh, especially with Krillian. We're very big supporters. There's also a student United Way. And so Brooks uh, is part of this. And, um, and so every year they kind of pick a topic to kind of uh, advocate for. And this year they pick Juling. And so uh, it's a group of kids and her and uh, other uh, leaders. And uh, so uh, they come up with this great poster. Don't jewel yourself, man. And uh, so, you know, articles say that e-cigarettes are better than smoking, but the truth is, you know, it's, uh, it may not be so good. So, and it's just a great picture, I thought, of, uh, you know, this guy with a whole pack of cigarettes in his mouth. So anyway, you'll see these posters around town. This is kind of their, their uh, effort to kind of get out the advocacy for, uh, for our area. All right. So Juul is very easy to access. Uh, kids report they have no problem getting what they need from that. Uh, we'll see if some of these changes that the company's doing and the FDA is doing uh, makes an impact on the easy access. But well, what about the other stuff in our area? So uh, when we look back at our surveys, 15% of our, of our high school students say that they've used prescription medications to get high uh, recently. Uh, and again, that's just incredibly high, right? Uh, the easy access uh, from their parents and their families uh, to get these prescription drugs. So this is kind of the good news, bad news slide. So the good news is tobacco use is decreasing, so kids are smoking less, but again, they're juuling. Um, alcohol use is also decreasing year over year, or study over study, uh, even binge drinking. So kids are reporting less binge drinking. Uh, and then there's questions on the survey, where do you get your alcohol? Well, they get it in their house. Their parents buy it, and it's there. Uh, and so when their parents are gone, they drink. Well, they get it from other family members. They go over to their friend's house, and their, and their friend's dad's got a liquor cabinet. So, all right, so uh, on my adult side of things, I'm just impressed daily about how much heroin and marijuana is in our area and how easy it is to access. It really shocks me almost every day 
when I, when I uh, you know, have our inpatient hospital patients and they've got positive UDSs for all this stuff. It's just crazy. And, and, and you know, this is a big opioid area, big heroin area, and it's showing up in our teenagers, right? So on the survey, 7% said that they've used heroin before. That compares to only 2% nationally. So that's just, uh, you know, get it so easy to get in our area, it's, it's unbelievable. Marijuana, I guess you can buy that anywhere you want. It's just like, you know, it's everywhere. I have no idea, but, but uh, kids say that they have no trouble getting it, and, and it's also a frequently used uh, substance. All right, lots of resources. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep kind of going over things. All right, so what about uh, some of the sexuality things? We do a lot of this in clinic, all right? So this is a, this is a lab result for uh, chlamydia. It's positive, all right? So we do a lot of screening for STDs. Uh, we do a lot of uh, these nucle nucleic acid amplification tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea. All right, and so here is the uh, stats uh, that Dr. Lance got from our health department. And look at what chlamydia is doing. Here's, here's Virginia just kind of, again, it's increasing, but wow, chlamydia is really just exploding in our area. And gonorrhea, look at that. The cases of gonorrhea are just exploding. So these kids are not using condoms, right? Or they're breaking. I don't know. They get all the breakable condoms somehow, right? They, like they think we're going to fall for that. I mean, come on. You know, we're not that. But. All right. So uh, kind of to the... Um, uh, for those who are doing mock and who are about to take their boards coming up and things like that, we'll do a little bit of a kind of medical stuff here. So, again, uh, most uh, teens, when they come in, are asymptomatic. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we pick them up asymptomatically. And actually, one of the chief complaints that come in is they're afraid their partner's cheating on them, right? Or they, their partner has cheated on them, and so they want to get tested. Uh, but if they have symptoms, it's the usual vaginal discharge, irritated, avoiding, abdominal pain. So, again, the most common thing that chlamydia causes is cervicitis. It can also cause the dysuria pyuria syndrome from urethritis in females. A pelvic inflammatory disease is one of the most common causes of that. And of course, for the residents for the boards, the perihepatitis or the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Uh, and then it may can cause proctitis in, in females as well. Uh, again, in males, uh, again, it's mostly asymptomatic or they're afraid that their partner's cheated on them. Uh, and so there's also dysuria, urethral discharge, or just a stain in their underwear. If, most commonly causes urethritis in males. It can cause epididymal orchitis. Uh, it can cause proctitis in, in uh, uh, men having sex with men. That's very common. Uh, and then again, there's a question if it causes chronic prostatitis. It has been isolated in the prostate tissue. Chlamydia has been. So, all right, and of course, uh, for you residents taking the boards coming up, it's uh, also about 1% of men who have um, uh, chlamydia go on to get reactive arthritis or the reactive arthritis triad, which is formerly called Ryder syndrome, the arthritis, uveitis, and urethritis. All right, so uh, besides the GU area, chlamydia can cause, if uh, secretions get an eye, can cause conjunctivitis, and that's the classic cobblestoning that you see here. Uh, there's a question if it causes pharyngitis. Uh, again, chlamydia has, ha has been isolated in tonsillar tissue before, and then certain serotypes call, uh, calls, uh, calls uh, lymphogranuloma venerium, the LGV, and again, that's a urethritis that ascends and gives uh, uh, lymphadenitis uh, in the inguinal area. And those are buboes uh, from LGV. All right, so treatment. Uh, this is right off of our intranet from the uh, antimicrobial stewardship page. Uh, so lots of uh, helpful resources on our intranet and the pharmacy. Uh, so the most common treatment is uh, azithromycin, one gram. That's what we give in our clinics if they can tolerate that. Sometimes it causes GI upset and they throw it up and we have to go to other things. But um, generally they tolerate the, the one gram of azithromycin. Doxycycline is also acceptable. Erythromycin is also acceptable. I've not seen that in a while. Uh, levofloxacin is acceptable. Amoxicillin can be used as well. All right, so those are the main uh, uh, common drugs for gonorrhea. Uh, ceftriaxone, we don't do that in the office. I don't think we do the, the suffixine orally, or do we do? No, we just do yeah. So we do ceftriaxone mostly. Uh, and then whenever you treat, whenever there's a positive gonorrhea, no matter what your chlamydia said, you treat for, for chlamydia. All right, so we're getting kind of late in the hour here. Uh, in addition to STD screening, we do all the other hosts of uh, sexuality issues. Uh, so I wanted to go over this slide just briefly. So. Uh, in the early 90s, we were number one. Uh, so we were number one in Roanoke for teen pregnancy. Uh, and, our, and our leaders got together and said, this is not so good. We need to kind of uh, fix this. So uh, the CEO, Tom Robertson of this hospital, got with the local CEO of Lewis Gale, the health department, the schools, uh, the United Way, uh, Blue Ridge Behavioral Health, and they all came together and formed a partnership and uh, put clinics out in the high schools, Patrick Henry and, and William Fleming, and as Jerry said earlier, they were just trailers out in the parking lot, and that's where our clinic was. 
Uh, but uh, that, that, was, that was very good because the kids were, we were right there on, on site. Uh, the kids could come out of class and, uh, and get taken care of. And so uh, that started uh, back, uh, back then. And, so, and, and through efforts with uh, our health educators like Brooks, uh, we improved that rate. So uh, now uh, we're number four uh, in the state. So we've made some uh, improvements uh, with that. All right. So uh, I'm going to kind of scroll through this real quick to see, uh, again, the, the apps and, and resources that we've used. So I'm going to stop now. I'm going to get Alex to come up and uh, pull up the last Kahoot for our mock. I'll get Jerry to come up uh, for a minute. And if you have any questions, we'll entertain those then. But if everyone to get their device back out, we'll do another quick Kahoot for our mock questions to uh, let this qualify for our uh, mock points. Uh, any questions? What do you think about some of the stuff we said? Alarming? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I've had some kids lately, and maybe anyone in this room, I'm just learning about this, um, telling me that they are using DAB. And they describe it to me. <laughs> they describe it to me, and, and I'm still not sure I have a full understanding of it. As in the jewel, they will have THC in the huh. If you guys heard of this, and, and I, I've seen it, I mean, I've, when he told me this, I'm like, dab, dabbing, you've been dab, what? And I looked it up, and sure enough, yeah, I think that folks are putting some of their own stuff. Good, yeah. Because you know, you know, they're pretty, um, and adults are inventive, yeah, yeah. and they are um, engineers in the making, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, try other stuff in the, you know, if this tastes good, what about a little... Oil. What about a little? <laughs> so, so there, um, you know, it's not just what the company sells. Um, it, it's also limited by the imagination of it. Your thoughts or questions, yes, sir. <laughs> They say about 200 puffs, so it's about a day. So if you smoke a pack of cigarettes, it's about a, a pot a day. Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. Left you so mesmerized with teens that you're just... All right. All right, y'all bring on to do.it. And uh, for further questions for Dr. Lance, please let us know. Go ahead and get your coot going. Come on, come on, play along. You got it, okay, all right. Got to type in a new number, though. Everybody on? Everybody online? All right. Teens are often deficient in all of the following except magnesium, vitamin D and calcium, fiber, or sugar. Stragglers here. Sugar. <laughs> all right. Good sleep hygiene involves all of the following except getting exercise, no caffeine after noon, getting plenty of magnesium and calcium, or putting your iPhone under your pillow. Somebody likes caffeine after noon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. All of the following antibiotics are recommended to treat chlamydia except Bactrim, doxycycline, azithromycin, or levofloxacin. All right. Very good. It's Bactrim. Okay. So doxycycline, azithromycin, and even levofloxacin are all okay and recommended. Uh, to treat chlamydia. Bactrim is not recommended. All right, chlamydia can cause all of the following except urethritis, cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, or cellulitis. Excellent. All right, very good. All right. Okay, guys, thank you. Welcome to our applicants, our VIPs. Hope you enjoy your, your visit with us, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for checking us out. Any questions uh, in the room before we duck out of here? We have a few minutes.
Any questions? All right, hang on a second. Hang on, before we, before we get everybody moving, we've got a few questions. Hi, not necessarily a question, but uh, this was a great uh, lecture. And um, this corresponds with a lot of what we um, are advocating with a group that I'm associated with. And a lot of you may be familiar with Dr. Allison Bowersox. Uh, she's one of the assistant professors over at VTC. She's also the co-owner of Runabout Sports, which is one of the local running stores here in Roanoke. And she just started a group called More Recess in the Roanoke Valley that is trying to advocate for uh, increasing recess times. Uh, one thing that she told me here that I did not know that um, – uh, there is a group working for legislation on middle schools that is not yet a law. No PE is required in middle schools. So we're trying to increase that to help to get their vitamin D uh, allocations there to improve their body images. Uh, one other thing that she says is that um, health care providers should engage in this process, lobbying schools to make changes. And for many kids, school is the only safe place for them to play. And that's a pretty true story. So uh, if you get the chance there, join the More Recess in the Roanoke Valley group on Facebook and um, be responsible stewards for our kids. Great resource. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Any other questions or comments in the room? All right. We have uh, a couple minutes. Let me unmute the phones here. Just We have a ton of people online. You guys are very popular. All right. Uh, for anyone on the line, if you do not want to ask a question or make a comment, please put your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, does anyone on the line have a question or want to make a comment? Come once, going twice. Um, I, I'll do. Uh, this is um, Alice Ackerman. That was a great uh, talk. Thanks very much. Luckily, I no longer have teens at home, but looking at the prospect of soon having a grandchild in middle school, uh, you know, all this stuff kind of keeps us out at a, a repetitive uh, level. Um, just this is a plug. I have no um, no ownership in this company, but uh, the, the app I actually recommend uh, to those that I recommend things to anymore for meditation, et cetera, is uh, Insight Timer. I find that as opposed to Calm, where if you really want to get the the daily um, input and the and the the stories, you ha actually have to pay a subscription. Insight Timer is free and constantly coming out with new uh, new meditations, stories, visualizations, etc. And and you can search it for what you want. And if they want just one minute of uh, a meditation, they can they can do that. So anyhow, that's my plug. Thank you, guys. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. And I want to—I uh, didn't realize you were on the phone, so that is a true VIP there. So um, I did want to talk about it in my history, but as I was getting kind of short. That uh, you know, again, as the that partnership that I was talking about with the adolescent clinics, uh, it was hard to keep together because funding was always an issue. And it was thanks to Dr. Ackerman who had the insight that. Um, that she needed to stabilize these clinics, and so she actually made it part of Carillion. Uh, and so that was just an excellent, uh, excellent move, and that is what stabilized adolescent care uh, in our area. And thank you, Dr. Ackerman. All right. Okay, round of applause. Any other questions or comments? I think we have time for one more. Anybody? Within the clinics, uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Within the, clinics the access uh, to mental health or counselors, because uh, we talked about, what, 71% before the action got started. Now we're at like 38% of mental health. Uh, where is the direction going with that? I know the... <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have uh, access to a psychologist both at the Central Teen Center and then um, Victoria goes out to um, the high schools as well. Um, Dr. Adams in the, in the psychiatry gang is just at the central location this year because um, our, our school clinic... Um, no-show rate, believe it or not, for psychiatrists was actually a little higher. So, um, so, we, so she's at the, the central location. So usually, certainly if we have a teenager in crisis, and um, we have several assets of folks that we can call around the community to to get folks in pretty quickly. Um, but Victoria uh, keeps pretty busy seeing folks um, in, in all those locations right now. There's always a need for more. It would be great if we had more. Um, they, well, it all depends on their insurance. So, yeah, the question was, that Scott asked was uh, about the cost, and most of the insurances um, cover. Okay. All right. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.